incarnational faith. That means that, like Jesus, our faith is not just an idea, but it gets lived out in real actions in the world. This week, we integrate money and meaning by looking at the courageous vision for our presence and impact in the world. In the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, George Bailey gets a wonderful gift of seeing what the world would have been like if he had not lived. Clarence Audubody, the angel sent to help George, tells him this. You've been given a great gift, George, a chance to see what the world would be like without you. Strange, isn't it? Each person's life touches so many other lives. And when they aren't around, it leaves an awful hole, doesn't it? Like George Bailey, we sometimes need help to see our true value. This is not the net worth we have, but it's the worth we give in the form of our offerings of love and presence and relationships. Let us prepare our hearts to listen to scripture. treasure in heaven. 
I've preached on this passage plenty of times, but never with any satisfaction. What the heck is treasure in heaven? I get the bit about the rust and the moths and the thieves and the stuff on earth. I get that. But what is treasure in heaven? That's just a blank for me. Who needs treasure in heaven? Isn't that the whole point of heaven? That there's nothing to have and nothing to prove anymore? Why should we be asked to hold back on our involvement with the things that we understand here in this life for the sake of elusive things that just get away from us um, sometime in the indefinite future? Now probably, you being you, you all figured this out a long time ago. But I'm getting it because of Brian. That it's about the value of what we live for. You've got so much energy and time and a lifetime and so much potential, the brains you're given and the talent, and so much privilege in terms of the, the good schooling that you might have had, the good parenting, the good neighborhood you live in. You get to choose what you make of all those things. There's part of us that's always going to be lured by obtaining more stuff. Evidently that was true in Jesus' day, it's truer in ours. Jesus says, don't invest in that stuff. Somebody could steal it from you, it's gonna just deteriorate. Collect treasure in heaven, he says. And I see now all the people who were here yesterday, the ones who use the pool and the library and the community center, the ones who enjoy the parks, and all of us who benefit in ways we don't even know from the research that Brian headed up at Boeing. And the Covenant Shores residents who got to enjoy those concerts and speakers that you lined up, and the grandchildren who were treasured. That's what Brian has to show for his life. Thieves can't steal it, and it doesn't wear out. And if all those people pay it forward, just think of how it keeps spreading. Goodness as far as the eye can see. So there it is, right? There it is, the choice, what your life is going to be about. In the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, the two options are drawn as a caricature. They are diametrically opposed. There's Mr. Potter, the villain. He runs a bank. His sole purpose in life is to make money, more and more and more and more money, by whatever means necessary. George Bailey, on the other hand, uh, has taken over his father's business. It's also called a bank, though it looks more like a credit union. People in the town pool their money and then loans are made so that people can buy houses. And one of the best scenes, they show us Bailey Park, a new development of low-income housing and all the needy families moving in. So at one level, it's clear. You can be a bad guy or a good guy. You can be selfish or you can be benevolent. You can serve your own bank balance, or you can serve other people. Guess which one you're supposed to pick. But the movie is a little bit more subtle than that, not a lot, but a little. George Bailey, bless him, doesn't see himself as a hero. For one thing, he didn't want to inherit the business. That's not what he wanted to do with his life. He didn't even want to stay in that town. He had much brighter dreams. He got stuck with it, and he was not happy. And then he found it hard work. That was not on his agenda either. So if you were to ask him about his life, you'd get a torrent of grumbles and self-pity. But then an interesting thing happens. Although it feels like the end of the world when his father dies, and George is forced to give up on his dreams and go to work, and although he takes up his new responsibilities with no grace whatsoever, over time, you see him change. There's a turning point on the day the stock market crashes, October 24, 1929. The whole town lines up outside the door of the bank wanting to get their money out. And George and his new wife take the money they got as their wedding present and they share it out. Enough that at the end of the day, they've only got $2 left themselves and the coffers of the bank are empty, but they're still open for business. Now that, think about it, that could have been the last straw for George, right? But instead, maybe for the first time, he discovers he's actually happy. 
And you realize now the guy is hooked. Now he actually cares about those people. Now he's there for them. Now the responsibility isn't a burden, it's his life's work. And years later, when he hits his own personal crisis at the climax of the movie, everybody in the town is there for him. Not so different from yesterday's memorial service, hundreds of people who have reason to be grateful for what one person made of his life. Today, as I said earlier, is the day that you get to pick up your CCMI covenant packet to take home. And really, it's all about that choice. You take the raw materials of your life and you invest them for the greater good. And there are no shareholders here. You will get nothing back financially for investment you make here. It all goes into changing lives. We get to see the results of those investments up close and personal. And while there are plenty of other places that invite you to do that one way or another, this one is ours. We decide what we'll build here, what we'll offer, how it's all going to work. We make it work. And we decide not by our own whim, though that might be fun, but by discerning together what we hear God wanting us to do. We get to roll up our sleeves and respond to the Spirit in tangible ways together, 100% hands-on. Year by year, this place exists because of what we give, of our time and of ourselves. The year we stop is the year that it grinds to a halt. It's as direct as that. Hear how powerful that is. So if it happens that you're one of those people who doesn't, by nature, like to give yourself away, if you've got your work-life balance thing so worked out that you never have one of those sleepless nights because of the stress, because of all the demands that want to do at once, if you tell yourself that the money is yours because you earned it and now you get to do whatever you want and just get yourself pleasure out of it, then God bless you. But think again. The choice is between you at the center and the spirit at the center. With the kicker being that the best, ultimately the only way to joy and fulfillment and a meaningful life, um, with the church full of them at your memorial service too, is by giving, and giving, and giving, and giving, and giving, and giving, and giving. Amen. I guess what we've achieved this weekend is to make Brian kind of a larger than life, heroic kind of guy. But looking around this room, I see lots of people who have given of themselves um, in their own way, every bit as much as Brian did. I wonder if for our prayers this morning, if there aren't some people we'd like to thank or thank God for thinking about ways they've given that have had an impact on our lives or on the lives of, of, of the city of organizations we love the life of this church. Um, prayers of thanksgiving would be good. And maybe you know people who are facing moments of decision in their lives. Prayers of concern for them would be good too. Share what you like, whatever is on your heart today. If at the end of what you share, you can say the words, this is my prayer. We will all respond, this is our prayer. And join the things in your heart into what's in all of our hearts together in a great prayer. offer a prayer of thanks for Marty Hartman. I don't know if you're familiar with that name. She's the Chief Executive Officer of Mary's Place. And on Friday night was the big gala event. I was on the committee and I'm so not a committee person. But anyway, we raised $1.8 million on Friday night. To, um, there was a very big corporate gift you may be aware of from Amazon. They gave them a million dollars and they gave them a motel. But the running costs have to be raised, so we're keeping the lights on, maybe solar panels. But give thanks um, for Marty Hartman's life and her team's work. This is my prayer. This is our prayer. Rob, tell us about the Burke. 
Uh, the Burke Museum uh, opened yesterday officially, and this morning I started to go there, and when I got to the bridge, I realized, no, <laughs> I'm going to church. <laughs> So I turned her, I went all the way across the bridge, turned her, I came back, and here I am. But uh, the Burke is a very exciting place. I would be very happy later on if you'd like to put together a little group from here to go visit it. Uh, it, like our church, has an extraordinary leader. And you know, you look to organizations and the leadership is what made them what they are. And Julie Stein is just remarkable in the complexity of what went into this. So the work is open. I'll be there from 1 to 5 this afternoon. Stop it. <laughs> it's a place that celebrates God's creation in every possible way. Thank you. Um, I was just thinking about that this morning, and I am going to put together a group um, and arrange with you to escort us through. If, uh, so anybody who is interested in, in uh, joining us, let me know. Uh, I'll set up a way online, too, that you can respond. So it'd be great to have Bob lead us through. I think we should wait about a month to serve. So That's what I was thinking, we'll to kind of give, yeah. 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 We'll let you recover from this weekend, Bob. <laughs> so sometime around late November. Uh, one of the blessings of our lives are friends here, such as Brian and all of you. You mean a lot to all of us. And one of our good friends is having heart surgery this week. I'd like to ask for prayers for Janae Chappelle, who used to live on the island. And we hope all goes well. This is my prayer. I have a prayer of thanksgiving for my mother. She's the one who in my life is modeled giving in a way that I still kind of don't understand. But growing up, I remember going to the food bank. We didn't have much. And um, even in the midst of all that, my mom always gave. Sometimes it seemed irrational because <laughs> we didn't have much. But she has always given everything and more. And it doesn't matter if she knows you well or not. She's the first one to be able to be empathetic on a personal level, not always on the larger global issues. But <laughs> she's always just given everything, given the shirt off her back every single time. So it's a prayer of thanksgiving for my mother. Let's continue in prayer. Creating God for the awesome wonders of creation incredible feast of family and friends, the plentiful riches of your presence among us, and all the things your spirit does, we give you thanks. We are so grateful for the pageantry outside, the glorious colors on the trees, the mountains, the lake, misty mornings and warm, clear afternoons, and 300 kilowatt hours of electricity generated this week like love from your hand. Thank you. Loving God, for those times that feel rife with heartbreak, too much stress and too little assurance, a plethora of pain and not enough possibility, be with us. Today, with Christians across the land on a day of prayer, we lift to you the turmoil in our nation over the impeachment inquiry which Congress has undertaken. We pray for integrity in the process and clarity in the outcome. We pray that we may come together as a nation around the high moral standards we need from our leaders. Show us common ground on which we can unite as a people instead of tearing each other apart. Gracious God, for those times when our contributions bring more negativity than positivity, more resentment than forgiveness, 
or in breaking down that lifting up, and give us. In this silence, we open the books of our hearts and make an accounting. Already we know you have balanced the ledgers. You hold nothing against us. You forgive all debts. We are deeply grateful, and we commit our lives to creating more good in the world. We make this promise in Jesus' name, and as he taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sin, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. I know it says Eric in the, con in the uh, bulletin, and if you're expecting Caruso, you will be very disappointed <laughs> to have me here, but I'm not going to say. One of the things about George Bailey's life was that soon after the movie starts and the depression hits in, he decides to commit suicide. And he walks out on the bridge, and he looks down, into the water, and he's going to go. God says, this is a pretty good guy. I don't want that to happen. And he sent an angel down to talk with George, to sort of see if they could work things out. And George Bailey stepped back and sort of reevaluated some of the things he was doing. Well, a thought that occurred to me as we uh, looked at that uh, there, it does fit with uh, Dale's comments last week about the congregation's financial vulnerability. Uh, sure, uh, George Bailey certainly ran into it, and so do we. But the thing about his being there, it reminded me that this was the Depression. Now, Jim Merritt is not here today, and he and I are probably the only ones who grew up during the Depression. But it was a very sobering time. It was a period when our parents had to look carefully at budgets. There was often, that required as when they went along. In the course of it, though, also, our parents had grown up in an era of tithing to the church. It's an old-fashioned idea, but it was very prevalent at the time. And at that time, many people took it literally as 10% to the church. As we went along, many people then concluded, oh no, it's 10% for good causes. And so the church got their willingness to share in that. Now, uh, we now do have an opportunity to support the church and other organizations as well. And let me remind you, though, the other organizations that are coming after you, the old-timers people and all the others, are probably contacting you four times a year, hoping that by the third or fourth time you'd forgotten you'd given it on the first time. <laughs> I belong to an organization, and I was going to count the frequency of solicitations, but it's at least six times a year. We do it once, <laughs> and we do it once, asking people to open their hearts and their brains and to see what can be done 
to take care of the financial needs of our church. So here we are at a time when uh, it is necessary to look ahead. The uh, Stewardship Committee has done so, has talked to a group of the elders and found that every one of them was willing to raise their pledge and was uh, willing to renew it. And in the case of the elders, they were asked if they would pledge for three years in order to give assurance of a road that would get us from here to somewhere in the future where we had to start to adapt and adjust even more to the fact that Jim and I may not be here, and, and, and which is still just a small part of the budget, but nevertheless it's illustrative of the fact that we do have some elderly people. I'm aware of the fact that some of us may be living on fixed incomes. As inflation goes along, your income doesn't. Nevertheless, if you can think of it this way, when you made your conscious pledge to the church, Starbucks coffees were probably $2. Starbucks coffee is $6 now, a fourfold increase. You're still buying the Starbucks, but what is being done in looking realistically at what we should do in support of the church. And without the church, we'd have a big hole. A thing that many don't recognize is Roberta's responsiveness to a problem. If there's a problem, she's there. She was very supportive and helpful of Brian through his whole experience. So, I don't need to conclude by saying really that many of us ought to sort of take a look at how we are allocating our funds. And if we're still allocating based on a $2 Starbucks, <laughs> rethink it. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Your offerings for God's good work in this place will now be received.